Dr. Inholt, it seems to be an epidemic in this country of kids getting very, very heavy. Why is that, and what can we do about it? One of the most difficult issues that we as a field are struggling with are what are the causes of this sudden and rapid rise in pediatric obesity. When we try to understand, it's important to realize that we're far less physically active than we used to be, let's say, in the days of the cave people. When we would go out, we would hunt, we would gather. This burned a lot of energy. Today, we spend most of our time behind desks. We take elevators and escalators to most places, and we'll spend an extra 15 to 20 minutes circling in the parking lot looking for a closer spot. At the same time that we've reduced the amount of energy that we burn, we've increased the amount of energy we consume. That is, we've had larger portions of French fries, popcorn, lots of snacks and junk food, and it's become a part of our culture that seems to not stop. Those two factors, the increase in the amount of calories we eat and the decrease in the amount of calories we burn, have led to a slow and steady rise in the increase in weight that we see in society today. What role does it play that, of genetics if you have a big father and a big mother? Is that the major role or a slight role in the whole issue? It's felt that genetics play at least 50% of a role in the reason that a child becomes overweight in the past. It would be very unusual to see a child that was overweight in the absence of having at least one overweight parent. I'm sorry to say today, however, that we're now seeing overweight children even in the absence of seeing overweight adults as parents. And this, of course, speaks to the fact that the newer and younger generations are being exposed to less physical activity as physical activity falls away from the school curriculum and an increase in, in calories, partly driven by advertising that children are exposed to during children's programming. In the first year, it's cute to have a nice, full-figured baby, but is there a point we reach we maybe have some concern even in the first year? When parents ask me whether or not they should be concerned about their child being overweight during the first year of life, I always recommend checking with your primary care provider, your pediatrician, who's best equipped to track your child's growth, weight and development on standardized growth charts. Should your pediatrician be concerned that your child is gaining weight excessively, that's the best place to start the evaluation and if necessary be reassured and if necessary be referred to the pediatric endocrinologist for further evaluation. If the child seems to be extremely heavy the first year, are there any tips you can give young parents with little children that could possibly do to maybe decrease the accelerated growth? Well, what's important to realize is that most children within the first six months of life are being fed almost exclusively by breast milk or by formula. It is a time where we're very reluctant to make any recommendations about changing intake to control weight. After the first six months of life, I think it'd be important for parents to realize that children do not need to consume junk food or lots of juices, in fact, and that if they follow their pediatrician's recommendations strictly, their child should be fine. And the fact is that there are many children who seem to gain a lot of weight during the first year of life who slim down once they become uh, capable of walking and moving around. So this is a particular time where we're careful about making wide sweeping recommendations to tell parents to cut down calorie intake because of the concern that we may be depriving those children of essential nutrients to allow optimal brain growth and body development. This new phenomenon, it seems that the TV with DVDs became the new babysitter. Is that a good habit to get in the beginning, or is that something maybe you should limit a little bit? I think it's important to stress that the television is, of course, not a substitute for interpersonal interactions with children and uh, adults. For a variety of reasons, I believe that television should be limited. A, it's important that children avoid the kind of images that television often portrays, in particular young children, which can be frightening as well as leading to distorted body images. Secondly, if they're sitting in front of the television, they're oftentimes not being active. So I, I would rather find other alternative means of keeping children busy and ways, of course, that would involve interacting with adults to give those children the opportunity to learn and model appropriate behaviors. So any form of stationary play, that be computer games, computers itself and TV, should be something like limited and more physical activity should be encouraged? Without question, we have to get back to basics, and that is children need to play and need to play actively. 
it's not appropriate for children to spend hours in front of the television and in front of uh, video games. In fact, the average American child today is spending anywhere between four to six hours a day in front of the television and in front of video games. We need to get back to basics, get our kids active and outdoors, limiting that amount of television and computer time as best as we can. What would be your best suggestion as a kid develops to avoid certain types of foods maybe in the diet that may be helpful or certain foods you encourage? What would that be? I often hear from parents that they don't want to quote unquote deprive their children of appropriate snacks because the rest of their friends are having snacks. I, I try to make the analogy that this is sort of like smoking. Just because other children are smoking and their parents may be permissive of that activity does not mean that we should allow our children to engage in the same activity. I think it's important that parents recognize a few basic concepts. One, that snacking on healthy foods like fresh fruits and vegetables are far better than snacking on chips, pretzels, potato chips, and junk food. Secondly, children will not peel fruits and vegetables, so if you have them ready, cut in the refrigerator, ready to take without having any preparation at all, your children are likely to consume them. Third, if you have sugar-containing beverages like juices and sodas in the house, because one person in the house may be lean and therefore feels that they can consume those kinds of products, it's very difficult to expect children to, to express or to be able to make a choice and deny themselves of those things, recognizing that it may not be the best choice for them. It's sort of like putting stumbling blocks in, fl in front of a blind person. So what I'd rather see is the removal of such products from the house, even if there is somebody in the house, for example, who prefers it, everyone in the family should recognize that true success is based on the entire family adopting a healthier approach to eating. Is corn syrup that you see in a lot of the foods good or bad? High fructose corn syrup, which is now a, a main ingredient of many products, including some of the breakfast cereals, is undoubtedly not the best form of sweetener that we can have. And what I urge parents to do when they go to the supermarket is to pick up the cereal boxes that they feed their children in the morning and look at the first three to four ingredients. If the first three to four ingredients are sugars of one sort of another, simple sugars or corn syrup, for example, that's a product that I would avoid because when children consume high levels of fructose or uh, corn syrup or sugars, they're going to experience a surge in insulin. And insulin is a hormone, a chemical messenger made in one part of the body that can in fact work on, on the brain to increase appetite. We need to institute whole grains and whole cereals and move the sugar much lower down on the ingredient list than it currently is for the most, most breakfast cereals that our children are being fed. If for some reason the child is very heavy and is say is a high school kid, are there programs around New York and other parts of the country that deal with this and what would be their goals and what, what the methodology to help these kids? Certainly what's most important to keep in mind is that parents in their best desire to help their children need to avoid negative reinforcement. Don't do this. I told you not to do that. If you do this, you know what may happen. It's important for parents to realize that those kinds of approaches aren't particularly effective. Rather, a multidisciplinary approach, that is, the use of exercise, the use of diet, the use of behavior modification, to change children's behavior and have the whole family participate, are key elements in true success. There are a couple of programs that I'm aware of. One program at the Maimonides Medical Center, which I helped found, called the Kids Weight Down Program, and a program here at the St. Barnabas Medical Center Ambulatory Care Program called the Healthy Life Program. Both of these programs excel in that they offer multidisciplinary approaches to children who are overweight, whose families and children require this kind of approach. So what the approach would basically would encourage what physical activity, selective eating, what? I think it's important to start with an assessment of the family, to get a sense of the family dynamic and what they're capable of doing. Secondly, a careful analysis of the child's physical activities in the past and in the present are also important. And lastly, and, the, and perhaps the most important element, is an analysis of the current dietary intake. 
once those three assessments are made and ready